Yeah. So, uh, take it away. Sorry, I didn't realize there's gonna be a lunch. Um, I'm not sure how okay you are with watching those videos, but uh, hopefully it will be fine. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, talk, uh, present myself a little bit. Uh, so I am a PhD student at the Boston University doing cryptography. So this is my fifth year. I will stay for one more year and then uh, probably go for academia. Um, I just want to talk about how I started flying. So my childhood was airplane-less. I never saw an airplane in my whole life until I was 21 or something. So in Russia, um, it, wa it used to be the case that airplanes don't fly above cities. So I really, really never saw an airplane uh, in real life. And then I had to take my first flight as a passenger and I was very worried because I knew many people have uh, aerophobia. So it was pretty nervous, but I actually loved it. But what changed my life was my second flight. Uh, because after that, I remember I came home and uh, I was sitting on my bed. I, I was sitting thinking I should do this. And not surprisingly, in less than a month, I found myself in the front seat of Cessna 172 in one of got forgotten Russian air, uh, airports. And uh, uh, so this was a summer when I was moving to the US. And once I moved, I started training in a cool airplane, which is called Piper <coughs> Cherokee. So for some reason, Cessnas are more pu popular airplanes as trainers than Cherokees, but look at the Cherokee, it's much better. You agree with me? Mm -hmm. So, right, it has a uh, low wind, which is very cool because if you don't step on the wind once you are getting into the airplane, then you're not a pilot. Okay? <laughs> so, it also has uh, manual flaps. It's like this manual uh, brake in the car they used to have, uh, same lever. Um, very cool airplane. But today, I want to talk about something different. Um, I will talk about two airplanes. Uh, one of them is called the Decathlon. Uh, the full name is actually American Champion Super Decathlon, which sounds a little bit too much, I think. Uh, but <laughs> the, the reason for this is that American Champion is the corporation which designs them. Uh, not designs, but builds. Uh, there is also what is called the Belanca Decathlon. And the model is called the Super Decathlon. Still too much, I think. So this is how it looks like. It's a high uh, wing airplane. And this is a default US aerobatic trainer. So if you ever think about starting learning aerobatics, there's high probability you will be doing this airplane. So the other airplane I will talk about is a, uh, it's called the L-29 Delphine. It used to be a trainer in a Soviet Air Force very long ago. Okay, they are very old, those airplanes. It's a very cool airplane, a uh, single engine jet plane. Okay, so here is what the talk will be about. I'll talk about um, aerobatics, what kind of maneuvers we fly and what kind of feelings you get out of it. And I will talk about uh, effects of aerobatics on human body and you should really think about G-forces. Then I will talk about aerobatic planes and what, difference, what kind of differences they have from real other planes. And finally, I will cover regulations. And the good news are that for your knowledge test, you only need this last part. And there are only two regulations you need to know. So that's basically we can sleep through the whole talk and only wake up for regulations. But I would do it the other way around if uh, I could. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is inverted flight. Uh, as you probably learned uh, yesterday or maybe long ago, the airplane can create lift by getting its air under some angle to its wing. Now, if you flip the airplane upside down and the wing is symmetrical, like here on the extra, uh, you still have the same picture. The, angle, the, air, uh, the air is hitting the wing under some angle of attack, and so it just generates lift uh, as usual. Now, um, in our airplane, which is the decathlon, the wing is actually not symmetrical. <laughs> uh, so what 
uh, happens is you have this asymmetrical airfoil and you generate some lift usually and when you flip it inverted uh, the picture changes a little bit but not too much so inverted flight is a little bit different from a normal flight with uh, non-symmetrical airfoil usually you need to have a higher attitude to get lift to keep you in the level flight but basically that's it uh, so airplanes can fly like this pretty easily. So let me show you a video. Of an inverted flight in a decathlon. And what I want you to look at is... Stop. So here is... What's going on? Your AV person has uh, play cap. This is why I never, never use American labor. You have to close the PowerPoint. Or like maybe, maybe not. Um. I don't so know. Does anyone know how to use Windows? If it's at a folded window, <laughs> you can drag it over from one screen to another screen. Oh my goodness. How, how do you do that? <laughs> Is there a way of grabbing the window to minimize it and then drag it over? If you do that. Oh, there was this. And then drag. Hold on, there was this one, function 8. Yep, hold on. Windows 8, function 8. Is it because of PowerPoint? Here it is. Duplicate. Duplicate. There we go. But I don't have to switch every time, right? Not anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I think PowerPoint will get you. It, it may. Okay, you might, okay. Have, to, you might have to. Okay, get thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to roll inverted, and here is the top of my head. And you can see how it is related with respect to the instrument panel, and just see what happens when I roll inverted. See how it moved up? So it used to be down here and now it's up. So why does this happen? Uh, <laughs> well, because uh, now I'm hanging on my straps uh, and it's a pretty cool feeling, uh, which everybody should try. <laughs> uh, okay, so now I need to reverse the whole thing? No. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna slide. Okay, awesome. Okay, so now the less known fact is that the airplane can also fly on its side when the fuselage is generating lift. <laughs> if you look carefully at the shape <coughs> of, the of the fuselage, it looks quite like this thing, actually. So what happens is, well, I don't know if you can do this with this airplane, but with those small aerobatic airplanes, you definitely can fly on the side what happens is the air still hits something which looks like an airfoil and it generates lift. Now, the fuselage is terrible at generating lift. Uh, it actually generates enough lift, but it generates a lot of drag. <coughs> so you cannot fly like this for too long unless you have a super powerful engine. You will lose airspeed pretty quickly. And let's try to see the video. So here is what it looks like. And you can see this is more or less 90 degrees, but it starts getting uh, shallower. Because uh, you lose airspeed, and it's getting hard to keep the airplane uh, where it should be. Okay, so probably the most popular maneuver in a robotic flight <laughs> is a loop, which is uh, the circular motion of your airplane. You go like this. Uh, it's a favorite maneuver uh, of many people, and this is the first maneuver where you actually experience some serious Gs. Uh, so depending on the airplane, you can 
have four to six Gs at the bottom of the loop. And you can have almost zero or as high as two Gs at the top of the loop. So with the decathlon, uh, the normal loop would take four Gs at the bottom and about a quarter G at the top, maybe. And uh, I have a video of how not to fly a loop. <laughs> Uh, so let me tell you first what's going to happen. So I'm going to break all suspense. So you can fly different loops. I'll cut the volume down a little bit so you can talk over the video. Ah, okay. You can fly a small loop like this. You can fly a big loop like this, provided you have enough airspeed. So the more time you spend in this position, uh, the more you bleed off your airspeed. And if you make a very shallow loop, you will just lose all your airspeed and will not make it over the top. And this is what I did. I started too shallow. I didn't pull enough Gs. And basically, the airplane stopped here, started shaking, and uh, stalled inverted. So this is what's going to happen right now. Okay, so we are going vertical. And all of a sudden, it stops. Oops. Tremble, stall inverted. Okay. This was actually pretty confusing. What made it confusing? Just that you were shaking? Because um, I was not, I didn't fly much uh, inverted uh, stalls that time, and uh, just, it was upside down. I mean, I was just disoriented. Yes, this is one recovery from this situation. I will show you the video. <coughs> okay. Um, so there are all kind of variants of a loop. Uh, you can make only a half of the loop, sorry, this way, half of the loop and stop here and then roll uh, upside up. And this is called an Emilman. And uh, let's see if we have a video. Yes, we do. Okay, hold on. So what I want you to look at this video is how you're actually trading your airspeed for altitude. So you start low, well, relatively low, but very fast. And as you climb, you are trading your airspeed for altitude, you will end up very slow, but higher. And uh, so the airspeed indicator, it's not in here, okay, you, you got to believe me. <laughs> no, no way. So this is what it looks like. How much did you climb right then? How much what? How far did you climb? How much oh, so about 500 feet. <coughs> okay, so another very popular maneuver yeah. is called the roll. And there are a lot of different variants of rolls. So the simplest roll is when you just take your stick and move it all the way to the left, uh, and you do something like this. Uh, another roll is called a barrel roll. It's actually a combination of a rolling motion and a pitching up motion, and it's a more complicated figure. It looks something like this. And another roll which we are flying in competition aerobatics is called a slow roll. And here you can uh, see a seemingly non-aerobatic airplane upside down. So this just shows you that the roll is not a violent maneuver. You don't need to pull any Gs here. So a lot of airplanes potentially could uh, do rolls. So it could be one G all the way around, right? Yes. If it's done correctly. So I could drink from my cup. OK, let me. And if it's done incorrectly, you just buy yourself a new airplane after something happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just looks very nice. <coughs> okay. 
So another set of maneuvers are vertical maneuvers, and hammerhead, as you said, is one of them. So in this maneuver, you go vertical until you start stopping in the air. At some point, the airplane will shake, and this is uh, its trying to tell you that I'm about to fall down. In this moment, you decide, no, I don't want to fall down like I did in the video. Instead, I'll kick the left rudder, and the airplane will do this. And then just fall down. And so this is a pretty fun maneuver. Before you stall, so you don't get into a spin? Yes. So you can see how the sun just stays there. So right now we are going vertical. And here is the shake, and we are falling down. I wonder if I turned the volume down a little too much. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe some sound. Oh, this is a very good question. It's a great question. Only the most intelligent speaker could possibly have prepared a slide on that topic. Yes, but this is at the very end of the slide, so <laughs> you have to listen for the whole con uh, for really? the whole presentation. Well, that's the regulation. Yes. I've seen presentations, but I thought and uh, you were off the charts. If the you <laughs> if you I fall asleep know. somewhere in the middle, then you might uh, skip this. So you should stay alert. <laughs> Okay, another maneuver, which is my favorite, is called a spin. Uh, this is different from other maneuvers because spin is a mode where your aircraft is out of control. So when you try to apply normal control movements like adding power or using ailerons, it would not uh, react in the way you would expect it to react. And so this, basically it's a falling motion of the airplane, just like the maple seed would fall down in a spinning motion. Uh, usually people don't do too many rotations, so we usually do one rotation, one and a half rotation, maybe two rotations. But I think um, rotating itself is not so fun. What is fun is the moment where you fall into spin. Let me show you a spin. So that's actually from the competition. So here is the spin, one and a half, almost. So I was supposed to be parallel to that runway, but not quite, whatever. I got lost some points because of that. And so <coughs> here is a moment of actually falling down. It's a very well-defined moment. You feel it. So you feel that you are flying, and then over a sudden, you stop flying and start falling. And if you guys skydived, you remember this feeling when you step out of the airplane and start falling. So it's pretty much the same, but less scary, which is good, I think, <laughs> unless you like being scared. Okay. Oh, uh, maybe you can yeah. explain how do you recover from the spin if it's uh, not if the regular controls and obvious stuff doesn't work. Oh, so, well, there is, a, every airplane has its own recovery uh, sequence, which you can find in POH for our airplane. So you first move the power back, you neutralize ailerons, then you uh, stop the rotation by applying opposite rudder, and then you very briskly push on the stick. Now, depending on the airplane, if it's a normal airplane, normal category airplane, you need to push all the way forward, if it's an aerobatic airplane, you need to push only to neutral. If you push all the way forward, you will enter inverted spin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. I was not joking. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> so let me just uh, try to explain why people love aerobatics. So first, all those sensations are very unusual. This is not something you will experience in other parts of your life. So even seeing the world upside down in a roll or inverted flight is amazing. 
Uh, you will get used to it after a while, but for the first time, it's really awesome. Also, all those Gs, it, uh, high Gs, low Gs, negative Gs, not something you can regularly experience. I know some uh, roller coasters actually can go three or four Gs. I don't know if anybody tried, but I never tried myself. So this is something which you cannot get anywhere else except for an airplane. Uh, besides being unusual, those feelings are actually very pleasant. So the near G feeling, uh, it's a very weightlessness feeling. You feel like you are floating in the air, like really flying by yourself. And you can get it at the top of the loop. It's called a float. Um, three, four Gs, at least for me, feel awesome as well. Especially when you don't fly for a long time and you come there and you pull some Gs, it just feels right. I don't know how to explain <laughs> it, but it's very cool. Minus one G, inverted flight, awesome. You hang on your straps. I don't know, uh, you should all try this. Uh, I feel a little bit stupid talking about this. You should just go and try. Falling into a spin is my favorite part of aerobatics. Uh, as I said, it's pretty much like stepping out of the airplane for a skydiving. So there's a, there's a lot of like really nice feeling involved. And the actual most important part is that the whole thing will make you a safer pilot. Okay. All right, so what kind of things you could do with aerobatics? So first, after you finish your uh, private pilot training, you could go for what is called unusual attitude recovery. Uh, so usually they provide you a spin recovery training and uh, what's called a noise hi nose high, nose low recovery. So basically if you find yourself suddenly going in this position, very uh, high attitude, very low airspeed, maybe banked. So what do you do to recover? They teach you those things. Uh, another option is just to do recreational aerobatics or some people call it unusual attitude entry, not recovery. So basically that's what I do. You sometimes go out and just fly a loop or two. It's very nice. And if you are doing any of those things, there is no excuse not to do the third thing, which is competition aerobatics. So it might sound a little bit harsh, especially when you just start flying, you think, okay, I did two loops, why would I go compete with those guys who fly for more time than I lived, okay? But you come there, it's amazing. So the people are completely awesome. They actually, this whole competition is just an excuse for them to hang out together. I remember my first <laughs> practice at Keen nearby. Um, I went there and somebody was practicing in the box. So what happens, they designate some airspace uh, for doing maneuvers and one guy is practicing and all other people are supposed to actually look and uh, judge him, but nobody cares. They're all just talking to each other, looking at other airplanes, the guy is just doing something there, nobody cares. <laughs> so it's a pretty funny event. Uh, so I highly encourage everybody just to try it once. Okay, so I want to talk about um, aviation physiology and namely how high Gs affect our bodies. So what's happen, what happens is the more Gs you pull, the harder everything in your body uh, becomes. And in particular, your blood uh, starts uh, going down towards your legs and your heart cannot push it. It doesn't have enough power to push it high into your brains. And so our organs need oxygen, which is provided by blood, but uh, some organs need more oxygen than others. Like if you uh, deprive your bones from oxygen, nothing happens. But if you deprive your eyes or brain from oxygen, something will happen. So as you pull Gs, the first, thing which will suffer is your peripheric vision. You will uh, notice the effect, which is called the grayed out, uh, when your vision on the sides disappears and is replaced by some grayish or brownish something. You cannot see anymore what's on the sides. The more you pull, 
the narrower, narrower this field of vision becomes until essentially what's left is this small circle of central vision. Now, if you keep pulling, even this will disappear, and now you are completely blind, but your brain still functions. You understand what's going on. Good news, yes. You understand what's going on. You just cannot see, but you can hear, and you can, to some extent, think. Uh, but if you keep pulling even more, uh, your brain will stop getting oxygen and you will lo lose your consciousness. How, how often have you experienced, say, a greyhound? Uh, so in this airplane, you usually don't pull enough Gs. So when I first uh, did a loop, it was a 4G loop, I, my instructor told me uh, how to counterinteract, I will talk about this in a second, but I did it wrong and I got a little bit of gray out. And after that, I don't think I ever got it in this airplane. Oh, well, okay, I once pulled five Gs and then um, I got grayed out. But then in L29, I uh, got it every single time. <laughs> okay. uh, but I never uh, lost consciousness. I asked the guy in L29 if he can knock me out, but he said no. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to add, so this little picture, uh, picture down there, um, I asked people, that's not uh, something that people get, apparently this is just my um, organism, so after I, l when I flew L29, after I uh, lost all my vision, the guy kept pulling and suddenly this is what wa uh, I was seeing. So it was some regular structure of lights of three colors. So apparently, I don't know anything about uh, how eyes actually work, so maybe some biology people could tell me what's going on. Apparently, something was pressing on something in my eye and hitting receptors, I don't know. Okay. But it was pretty interesting. Okay, so there are some ways to counteract uh, effects of positive G. So one thing is called straining muscles, or sometimes it's abbreviated to AGSM, uh, anti-G straining maneuver. Mm -hmm. So basically, you want to prevent uh, your uh, blood pulling into your legs. And you do this by straining muscles in your leg and in your tummy. So go like this, and uh, you do this before the maneuver, you strain and then you pull. And this gives you one or two Gs of extra tolerance. Uh, now, another technique is a proper breathing, which I don't know, but they do it in military when they need to pull like really heavy Gs. Now, another thing which is very useful is called a G suit, and they have something here. So this is how it looks like. You cannot really tell that this is something you <laughs> can wear, probably, right? So you basically wear it like this, and uh, this goes uh, around your leg. And this has this tube, which is connected to a special system in the airplane, uh, which uh, basically pumps, com <laughs> <laughs> uh, pumps compressed air inside this tube, and this air goes into the chambers. So uh, those pumps have the chambers here, I'll do. So this is what happens. Um, the more G you pull, the more pressure it exerts on the air, and those chambers become inflated. And they exert pressure on your legs, preventing your blood from pulling in your legs. <coughs> Now let's talk about uh, negative Gs. So negative Gs are worse. First, they are not pleasant. And second, you cannot counteract them. So basically what happens with negative Gs is your blood gets pulled in your head and it starts uh, pushing on your eyes. And this is pretty unpleasant. So minus one G is okay. It's just an inverted flight. Minus one and a half already was uncomfortable for me. Okay, so and here are some typical human limits. They really depend on whether you are fit, whether you have a low pressure or high pr pressure, whether you are doing this AGSM maneuver, whether you are wearing juice suit, etc. 
Any questions? Yes. Uh, negative one point five. Did you have a red out at all? Did you have any red? No, no, no. I didn't. But it was like I felt it pushing on my eyes. It was unpleasant. Okay, I just uh, wanted to say a word about uh, how different uh, the airplane handli handling becomes. So when you fly a regular airplane, uh, the forces which you experience on the stick and panels are different. So when you are landing, you are going at a very low speed and you feel that your controls are uh, pretty light. When you are traveling fast, you feel them to be more heavy. But with aerobatics, this range increases significantly. So when you are in a spin, controls feel disconnected. <laughs> you don't feel any resistance at all. When you are going pretty fast near your uh, maximum speed limitation, you might actually have some trouble moving the controls. And you can see, so this scene in the decathlon is called a spade. It's basically a surface which is connected to the aileron and its purpose is to uh, make the feel of the ailerons easier because the previous airplanes uh, of this model, from what I heard, were very heavy on the ailerons. Okay, so another thing is that different um, gyroscopic effects get more pronounced because you are moving slower and I want to give you some toys. So what is this? This is a gyroscope and you can start it like this. So it starts rotating and gyroscopes are magic as you have probably seen. So if you just play and they just uh, uh, send them back on so people can play with them. And so what's important is that you have a very big gyroscope in the front of your airplane which is called a propeller. Propeller is a heavy mass which is spinning fast. So a big part of the, your actual weight of the airplane is a rotating mass. So I the airplane sometimes behaves in a way which you wouldn't normally expect. So for example, if you try the following, imagine you are in a hammerhead and remember the hammerhead is this. So you go like this. When you start feeling the shaking, you are at a very low speed, you kick the left rudder and you turn. Now, if we didn't have the propeller, that would be it. But we do have this rotating mass. So, when you're going up and trying to move it this way, the gyroscopic effect actually pushes it this way. So what happens with the airplane is you go up like this and start storing the gyroscopic effect wants to push you on your back. And this is a great recipe for inverted spin, which I don't like. So you need to counterinteract it by feeding in a little bit of um, forward uh, stick. Okay, so in general, aerobatic airplanes are much less stable than normal airplanes, so there is some FAR which talks about certification of airplanes. And it says that single engine airplanes not certified for aerobatics, okay, non-aerobatic airplanes, must not have a tendency to blah 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 depart control flight. So to translate this on English, non-aerobatic airplanes should be stall and spin resistant. Aerobatic airplanes, we don't have any guarantees. And actually they make them uh, so that they are unstable, so that they are easy to put into a spin. Okay, so I want to talk about aerobatic airplanes. So on the left there is the decathlon, which our clubs have. <coughs> on the right there is a Russian airplane, Yak-52. And on the lower uh, row there are some more advanced airplanes like Extra and Pits. <coughs> and if you look carefully, you will notice that three of the four airplanes are tailwheel. So a lot of uh, aerobatic airplanes are actually tailwheel airplanes. Uh, so tailwheel airplanes are a little bit funny on the taxiing 
But uh, what's more funny is that if you look at this guy in the extra, try to imagine how much can he see through this uh, uh, canopy. Well, probably not too much forward, right? So now imagine you are taxiing. You better know where you're going. This guy doesn't know where he's going. So to taxi, what you need to do is called S turns. When you're taxiing, you're constantly doing this. Now, uh, tailwheel airplanes are not as popular as they were once, and not many people know that this is required for a tailwheel airplane to taxi safely. And when people see somebody doing this on the taxiway, they go on the radio, which happened to me, and say, are you doing this on purpose? Maybe they, he thinks I don't know how to taxi. <laughs> but this really happened to me. Uh, but now you know. Okay, so obvious uh, difference from non-aerobatic airplanes that they can withstand more G-forces. So here is a copy from POH of the decathlon. It says that uh, it can withstand uh, plus 6G, which is hell a lot. And uh, the L29 can actually withstand 8Gs. So I cannot, okay? Marcella, can you explain why it might be in uh, two different categories at different times? Ah, okay, so... Depending on the, so what's very important for aerobatic is the proper weight and balance. Uh, it's very important to have your uh, center of gravity uh, forward. Uh, so there are some li limits. You can open the POH and see there is a chart which tells you, depending on your loading, on how, like, who sits and how much he weights and where exactly he sits, uh, you can figure out where your center of gravity is and whether this is good for aerobatics or not. So if I put a lot of stuff in my baggage department, my center of gravity will be far and that's going to be bad because the airplane might not recover from a spin. So before doing aerobatics, you need to make sure that you are within limits. So basically that's why this, they have different uh, things. Right, so why can it withstand more genes? Well, it has uh, reinforced wing structure. So for instance, uh, here is a tail section of decathlon, and you can see those wires which keep the stabilizer attached to the airplane. And here is a piece that also has this uh, reinforcing wires here. Here is a picture of another decathlon. You can see the struts, um, much like in Cessna, but a little bit more withstanding. So that's very important because like, think about what is 6G. So you have an airplane which generates lift, six times more lift as it would normally would, which tries to bend your wings upwards. So you need some way to counter it uh, interact it. Okay, and so I want to show you something. So I'm not a very good at building airplanes, but so this is roughly how the internal uh, piece of the wing looks like. So you have this thing, which is called a spar, uh, this long uh, thing, and it basically is the main element of the wing, which prevents the wing from bending. And if you look at this picture, you can see those additional wires, which this uh, wing doesn't have. So they are there to help the wing stay in one piece, basically. Okay, something else you will not find on standard airplanes is called a G-meter. So this is a G-meter from the decathlon, and you can see that minus 5 and the 6 Gs are marked with red, so those are uh, the limits for the airplane. And you can see three arrows, so this arrow shows the current G reading, which is 1, and these two arrows are showing the minimum and maximum Gs you, exp you encounter. And by the way, note how ergonomic this scene is. So you can you have uh, one G on the horizontal marking, which is very easy to pick when you... So when you fly, you need to keep track of a lot of things, and you don't have time to actually read stuff. And what you are doing is you are noting the position of the arrow with your eye. And so one G is very easy to note because it's horizontal. And the same thing, I don't know if they did this on purpose, but the 5G is not the limit, but it's <coughs> the number where you need to start thinking about not pulling harder. 
and it's vertical, which is also very uh, convenient to peak uh, in flight. And here is L29 G meter. You can see it's in opposite direction, so it's increasing this way. And you can see limits 8 and minus 4. And you also note that there is some ergonomics here. So there is the upper limit, it's on the vertical marking. And 0 G is on the another vertical marking. OK, so obviously aerobatic airplanes are certified for aerobatic maneuvers. So this is a picture from Decathlon POH. It says, loop normal inverted, you enter at 140 miles per hour. I don't know why, but this is not a knots airplane. So usually we measure in a speed in knots. But Decathlon, for some reason, is a miles per hour airplane. Just I guess just to mess the whole thing further. I don't know. OK, so. Aerobatic airplanes have harness, not just harness, but like capitalized harness. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see those uh, lap belts here and shoulder belts here. And what you also need is a fast way to escape your airplane if something happens. And those harnesses take a long time to attach, but if you need to escape the airplane, you need to do just one movement to get rid of them. So basically, you're sitting like this. And there are two handles <laughs> on this harness. You push like this, and you are free from the airplane. So just one movement. OK, another thing you need to do is you need to escape the airplane. So in the decathlon, there is a pin here and a handle, which you can pull and rotate. And this jettisons the door. So basically, you are doing three movements. One, you are free from the airplane. Two, three, the door flies away, and then you can go out. And hopefully, you have a parachute at this moment. <laughs> okay. And so here is uh, L29. It has um, an eject ejection system. So here is the seat. And here is the right handle. And you can see this red handle. It's actually uh, the lever for jettisoning the canopy. Uh, you can see this pin here on this uh, green uh, tie. This is a pin to prevent uh, accidental firing of the catapult on the ground. And so what you do is you first uh, push this lever like this, and then the canopy goes away. And then there is this lever here which you need to squeeze, and this fires you up in the seat. And this system is actually pretty complicated because there is another guy behind you and you cannot eject at the same time uh, because you will damage each other. So once you move this lever and the canopy goes away, it actually blocks the other guy's system. So once you did this, you, you, the other guy cannot eject until you eject. But to prevent, like everything in aviation is uh, fail safe, so to prevent some possible negative effects of this uh, connection, the other guy actually has a manual um, way to override this rule. So he can move some handle, and then he can still eject. And you can collide in the air if you want. <laughs> this is a good illustration of when you fly complex aircraft, the good rule is if a switch has dust on it, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, so those switchers you don't want to touch. They have dust on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's in the same for the belts in L29. Basically, you have four belts, and they go into the same lock. And you need to press some secret combination of uh, levers there. And then it unlocks, and you are free from the airplane. Okay, so two more things I wanted to talk about. Obviously, if you want to go inverted, you need your systems to work in this environment. Um, first, many airplanes uh, are gravity fed, meaning that, like, imagine Decathlon, it has a high wings, and fuel is inside uh, wings. So normally, gravity pushes fuel down to the engine. But when you go inverted, things flip around, and now you don't have this anymore. So there is inverted tank, which is located un underneath, uh, which normally gets fuel from normal tanks. But once you get inverted, normal tanks cannot supply fuel anymore. But now inverted does. And this gives you about two minutes of inverted flight. 
and the same you for oil system. So another detail which you might not be familiar with yet is so some uh, instruments uh, in the airplane are gyroscopes. And for instance, the attitude indicator is a gyroscope, but it may tumble. Essentially, this renders it inefficient. It m might even break it. For instance, if you look at the Cessna POH, the Cessnas are allowed to spin, but many air clubs, including <coughs> our air club, do not spin Cessnas because uh, attitude indicators in Cessnas might be damaged by spinning. And so there are two solutions uh, for this problem. So either you install much more complicated and much more expensive attitude indicator, like they did in L29, which actually doesn't tumble, or you just don't put it inside, like they did in the Degathlon. Like there is no attitude indication here. OK, so reg uh, regulations. And this is a part for your knowledge test. And this is the answer to your question. Uh, so there are only two FARs you need to know. One FAR talks about what aerobatic flight is. I think this is like the, the most useless definition ever. And the second part uh, t t uh, tells you where you can do aerobatics, or rather where you cannot do aerobatics. And one more FAR is not about aerobatic per se, but it specifies when you need to wear a parachute. And uh, in most cases, in aerobatic flight, you will be falling under those rules. And you might ask, what about ratings? And the answer is, there is no aerobatic, uh, aerobatic rating, uh, not for instructors and not for students. So any CFI is legal to teach you aerobatics if he wishes to do so. But not all of them I wish, actually. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about is that you might need a tailwheel endorsement um, for some airplane. As I said, the default airplane here to learn aerobatics is a decathlon, and this is tailwheel. So you will need your tailwheel endorsement for it. Okay, so let's look at FARs. First FAR defines aerobatic flight, uh, which says, Intentional maneuver involving abrupt change in attitude, abnormal attitude, abnormal acceleration, not necessary for normal flight. This is kind of very vague definition, and you know they had to put something, so don't worry about it. But what you should know is those rules where you cannot do aerobatics. And this looks like a lot of rules, but it's convenient to group them into categories. So basically, the first two rules uh, tell you, you need to make sure if anything goes wrong and you need to bail out and the airplane will presumably go and crash somewhere, you need to make sure that you don't hit anybody or anything. Okay, So you obviously cannot do this above any houses, cities, towns, whatever, or above any crowd. So the second uh, rule tells you don't get in the way of other air airplanes. So when you will be having fun in the air, your attention might get all sucked by the maneuver you're doing. You will not be looking around, although you should. Uh, so it's very important to stay away from congested areas. So basically, you cannot do aerobatics in any designated airspace from the airport. And you cannot do aerobatics within four nautical miles of the center of any federal airway. If you look at the chart for the Boston, Boston has Logan Airport, and it has Class Bravo around this airport, and it takes a lot of space. And then out of Boston, you have this net of airways. So basically, there are only a few places where you can do aerobatic uh, near Boston. And what where we do it I is we go northwest around Fitchburg, it's about 15 minutes of flying. So when Philip said that I am a very good pilot, what he meant is that I'm really good at going Fitchburg, Hanscom, Fitchburg, Hanscom, Fitchburg, Hanscom. I'm doing this for a year already. Okay. And the last part finally takes care about you. So you are not supposed to do this below 1,500 <laughs> feet and when flight visibility is less than three miles. Now, this is not an invitation to do this at 1,500 feet, okay? 
I usually do this uh, around 4,000 or 5,000 feet. Okay, so any questions about this far? Yes. In some of the previous uh, videos, I saw you over the airport. Yes, good. So this was a competition, and what they did is they actually uh, contact FAA and they sign a w they get a waiver which tells them this is your airspace you can use for competition for flying aerobatics and it's a lot of work to do this so normally you're not allowed okay so the second regulation is not about aerobatic per se but it tells you when you need to wear a parachute so first you need to know that your parachute has to be repacked, oops, repacked every six months. So most parachutes are nylon now. And second, it tells you that whenever you are exceeding 60 degree bank or 30 degree pitch up or down, which you will be doing in aerobatics, you need or not need the parachute as follows. So when you are solo, you don't have to wear parachute. When you have somebody else on board, this depends. So if you are training for a rating with a certified instructor, for instance, for commercial license, you need a spin training. You no, don't have C a choice. Not commercial, CFI only. Yeah. Oh, CFI, okay, I'm sorry, so this is wrong. So if you, need a, if you are doing your CFI training, you need a spin, you cannot get away. So for this, you don't need a parachute. In all other cases, you do need a parachute. For instance, if you are giving a ride to your friend, you do need a parachute. If you are practicing for the competition with your instructor, you are not doing this for rating, so you still need a parachute. You can go and look at the actual FAR. I think it's written in the most uh, crazy language I've ever saw the FAR written. It's very hard to understand what they mean, but basically this is what this means for you. They actually define those not in terms of solo, not solo, but rather is the other guy the crew member or not. But you will be flying airplanes where you are the only uh, crew member, so for you this means solo, non solo, essentially. Okay, now, so I think best course of action is to memorize these complicated regulations, but always fly with a parachute. There is no reason why you don't take a parachute on board. Okay. Just so people don't freak out about how much they're going to have to, I think, mm -hmm. I think on the test, there, I think it's stuff like this they ask you about <laughs> how much do you have to be pitching up or down or banking before, you know, it's aerobatic and it's time to use a parachute. They're mm -hmm. not going to ask you about uh, this kind of detail down here. Okay. Well, good. So here is a picture of David, and I'm sitting in the back. And we are going to the practice at Keen. So this is not an aerobatic flight. We are just ferrying the airplane. But as you can see, this backpack on his bag is it's actually a parachute. So David is smart, be like David. And I, I was also smart. I also had my parachute. There is no reason not to wear a parachute, because you never know what happens. OK, so let me summarize. Uh, first, aerobatics is a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully, I convinced you. Uh, second, uh, there are two regulations you need to know about aerobatics. And note, if you don't do aerobatics, you still have to memorize regulations, so it's kind of you're suffering for nothing. So if you memorize those anyway, you just go and do aerobatics. Uh, and so there are some places in Boston you can uh, get aerobatic instruction at. So we have uh, two instructors at East Coast, uh, Mark and Bill, and two instructors at EFA, Rob and Victoria. And if you have any questions, this is time to ask. Yeah, let me, because uh, we're running a little bit behind. How about this? We'll take uh, a five-minute uh, restroom break. Uh, anybody who has a question for Roxana can come up and ask individually. And then when we come back, uh, Tina will resume with her pizza interrupted uh, presentation. Are you using your laptop? Or no, thank you.